Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, December, September 4th, 2014. This is the Week in Charts. We've got a lot to cover this week, so I'm going to go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this free endorsement. But hey, PepsiCo, give me a shout out. Red Bull setup's too fat. I just realized something. I don't. I never thank you guys at the beginning. I always thank you at the end. So, thanks for showing up. Appreciate that. I'm humbled by your presence. Oh, good stuff. All right. All right. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. This is part of the show where I beg for a book review. And the reason I do that is occasionally you have these people who are malignant in life. And they review the other reviews. So I'm talking about the layman's guide to trading stocks. And that aggravates me. So if you're going to review the book, that's fine. I mean, I got one guy out there, give me three stars, kind of halfway ripped me a new one because it's a lot of work. And, you know, I think it's a good review because it is a lot of work. Uh, and I'm not sure why he just gave me three stars because he seemed to like the stuff. But anyway, but it helps to balance things out. All right, uh, enough of that. Um, it's a good word for begging. I have to pull up visual thesaurus, I guess. Enough of that BS. What are we going to talk about? Um... Well, obviously, let's talk about current conditions, and uh, so far, so good. We're going to talk about current conditions. We'll get to that after a few slides here. I want to talk a little bit about the nuances of volatility. I did a lot of volatility research early in my career, fairly early in my career, and along with the momentum stuff, and it, and it, it helped out a lot. It does, it does help to learn as much as you can about as many different methodologies, but at some point, it's important to stick to just – one methodology, and, and the things you learn help help you uh, become part of you or make you who you are, and I'll uh, talk about that in just one second when we get to volatility. Uh, I want to continue on the theme of the intertwined nature of the, the methodology, the mind, and the psychology, and the money management. Um, I went to delete those slides, and, and then before I could delete them, I just couldn't bring myself to delete them. I ended up adding another one. So... Uh, we'll check that out. Uh, the second of nine lives of the IPO bubble. It's kind of interesting. Um, we, I did the stock selection webinar back in December of last year, late last year, and I noticed a lot of IPOs were doing incredibly well around that time. In fact, a lot of the stocks that I picked for the webinar were um, IPOs. And if you go to my website on the store, and go to the uh, stock selection course, you'll see that the stocks really had a pretty good run. It was it was really, um, it's probably one of the best, or one one of the best, I should say, um, lists that I picked for stocks. Almost all of them took off, and they took off nicely. And quite a few of them were IPOs. So it really got me thinking about the IPO market, and, and I really started studying it in a lot more uh, detail. And I realized that, hey, wait a minute, we got a bull market going here in these IPOs. And I kept wanting to do a course on IPOs, but I kept thinking as soon as I do it, the IPO bubble is going to pop. And I did a course, and then the IPO bubble sort of appeared to popped, but appeared to have popped, he tried to say. Well, what I'm wondering is, has that IPO bubble, uh, does it have nine lives? And I think it might just have nine lives, and, but without explaining the whole thing to you, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Anything you want me to cover, let me know. It seems like this week was a week where... I got a lot of questions for people. I answered the questions, but I also said I'll cover the webinar if you want me to. So if there's anything that doesn't get covered, let me know. And uh, worst case scenario, it'll be uh, fodder for next week's webinar. Okay, question is, is there a big move coming based on the volatility of the market? As you may know, volatility is very cyclical. And um, early on, even long before I met uh, Larry Connors, uh, he sort of inspired me to do some volatility work. And then um, what's the other guy's name? I don't want to leave him out. I think it's Nathan something. And that's where I think some of Larry's volatility work came from. Um, I apologize. I wonder if I have that book handy here. 
Um, anyway, he uh, Nathan talked a lot about volatility, and it was one of the um, oops. Nathan talked a lot about volatility, and was one of the first volatility books that I read. Anyway, um, his name will come to me. It's a, it's like a big name. Um, I tried to walk over to my bookcase, but it pulled out my <laughs> my card. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll get that name for you. I have a biograph. I'll have a. Um, in fact, I can find it. Uh, I'll have it for you anyway. But anyway, this guy um, Nathan and and Larry Connors. Uh, had done a lot of volatility work, and I and I kind of um, studied their work. And one thing I learned is that volatility is very cyclical, and that's what uh, one thing Connors were saying is sometimes it's more cyclical than price. So my thinking was, if I could figure out how to predict volatility, then I could make a lot of money in the markets. And I kind of strayed a little bit into this, and then I realized that oh, I'm just to stick with the momentum because it's a lot more simpler. But the volatility stuff can be quite useful at times. Uh, volatility tends to oscillate between high volatility and low volatility. And if you think about it, let's say like 2009, you got a market that does this, it all of a sudden just implodes, okay? The volatility goes through the roof, and then the volatility itself implodes, and then that market starts working its way higher. So sometimes like at a spike bottom like this, you have a huge spike in volatility, but then it exhausts itself. So Maybe it's not quite as cyclical as this, like everything might overshoot a little bit and, and undershoot. And that's one of the, actually, that's actually one of the anomalies of volatility. It tends to overshoot itself. So when you get a low volatility situation, it not only reverts back to the mean, but it does overshoot itself. I guess that would make it cyclical. And I guess the point is it not only overshoots itself, it overshoots itself and then some. So it might go like from down here to way up here and then to way down here and then back. So it is cyclical. One of the other nuances that I learned about it, I kind of figured this one out on my own a little bit, but uh, others, such as Larry, had kind of figured it out too because it was funny. It was like um, before I met Larry, I'd written an article about the um, you kind of have a fake out first and then you have um, the real move. And it's uh, I wrote it in 1997, in 1997 for stocks and commodities, and it was called the volatility trade in gold. And my point was that when volatility gets really, really low, the market is you know getting really tightened up, kind of like I guess like a triangle or something in technical analysis terms. You know it's due to take off, but if you wait for that market to fake out in one direction and then look to go the other direction, when that volatility begins to revert to its mean, sometimes you can capture a pretty cool move. And it will actually test out. I've actually done mechanical testing on that longer term. Now, this is a little bit more involved than what I normally do, but I just want to kind of show you that situation because it's developing in the S&Ps. Now, I haven't measured volatility in the P's up until about 20 minutes ago. And I was just saying that the volatility had dropped because we closed here, 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 and we closed here, okay? And then before that, you had to close here and here. So you could see if my pin were just a little bit fatter or if I just kind of go over these closes a little bit, you could see this market remained relatively unchanged. Now, if you didn't know anything about volatility, just know that traders don't agree for long, okay? So market is due to move one way or another, basis the piece. Now, again, I did study all this kind of stuff over the years, but now more often than not, I eyeball it. I would not have plotted this volatility this morning except for the fact that I wanted to show you what it's going to look like if you actually use the volatility. Now, this is a... Uh, 6 divided by 50 ratio, and this is just your 50-day HV, okay? So the ratio is, is you look at a short period of time versus your longer period. So you look at these last six days, and then you compare them to the last 50 days, okay? And it's pretty cool because it does give you a sense for what volatility is doing. Notice we had that big spike in volatility. And then what happened? The market bottomed out, okay? And then we had a fairly persistent move, and that's a bit of an anomaly. That's kind of a lesson 201 or 301. 
but that will force volatility to drop. But when it gets sideways and the closes are relatively close to each other because it's measured on a closing basis, the volatility will really begin to implode. And Connor's research was when it gets below 0.50, half below the normal, it's due to revert to the mean. Well, you can see it's half of the half. I'm sorry, it's um, when it's below, yeah, so it's like one quarter percent where it normally is. So we're probably due for a bit of a move in the market. Um, I would prefer if we had a bit of a knockout move like that and then it took off because I know that will test out. But it, we could end up in a blow-off mood um, also. So I, I, the point is I think the market's due to move. And uh, But here's the thing. It's not – what I have observed is not – anything that hasn't been observed over the years because what usually happens during the summer, we did have a bit of an aberration this summer, but usually volatility as a general statement is very seasonal and the summer tends to drop off. Traders go to their vacation. Did I just say dare? They go to their vacation homes uh, or wherever and it's not as, um, as many players, so the market tends to chop around a little bit. Volatility tends to drop, but guess what? It comes back in the fall, usually peaking when? Well, October for some um, reason. I don't know exactly why it's October. Maybe somebody else, maybe somebody in here might have an idea, and we could uh, throw that out. But the point is that the volatility has dropped off significantly, especially when you, when you look at it on a relative basis. You could say, well, it really hasn't done much. It's kind of just flatlined in here. But when you look at it on a ratio basis, you can see that this market has definitely has a very low volatility. So it's due to revert back to mean, due to have a big move. Okay, um, You have an expansion of volatility, then you have a contraction of volatility. Okay, And you can see just kind of rinse and repeat. That cycle goes over and over. So I guess uh, one, th one takeaway from this, not that I wanted to get into it, but if you're ever in a market like 2009, where before, what was it, before March, I forget exactly when it bottomed, maybe it was March, uh, I know we started seeing some buy signals in early April and right around the end of March. But when you see it spike down and that volatility go to extremes and the VIX go to like a million or whatever, um, then that's the time that you might want to think about uh, maybe uh, taking some of those those windfall profits a little bit, lighting up a little bit on the short side, or at least follow your plan. Just trail your stops lower. Um, be careful on putting on new positions because it's possible that that's an exhaustion type of move um, where everybody just throws their hands in the air, market drops like a stone, and then that's it. It exhausts itself. Um, by the way, speaking of the VIX, I don't want to go off on too many tangents here, but somebody was asking about why the VXX went down when the VIX went up. And the reason is that the VXX is based on the futures, the S&P futures, which is constantly changing and constantly decaying. And then you have a rolling thing um, that, that happens there, contango, I think is what they call it. And it creates a horrible tracking error. It creates a horrible decay. So... If you're going to mess around with trading some of these VIX type of ETFs, I would like to warn you right now that it's a lot more complicated than it might appear on the surface. And even if you get market direction right, you could actually lose a lot of money in those VIX instruments. Uh, Larry McMillan did a really good speech on those. And if you get a chance to see Larry, you always learn something good from him. Um, but it's a little bit, I just, what I learned from the speech was that you don't want to mess around with them. Unless, of course, you make that your um, primary thing you're doing. But make sure you study it really well because you can get a lot of trouble. Now, if you think about the VIX, it's a, deriv it's a derived indicator. And then if you think about the VIX or the futures, you're looking at a derivative on a derivative. And, boy, it gets really complicated really fast. And just to kind of close the loop on that, the VIX is a 30-day perpetual. I'm pretty sure it's 30-day perpetual. So it's always going to be 30 days, whereas those futures are decaying and you got old futures coming in and new futures going in, and it gets really messy really fast. Now, I don't mean to digress on that, but um, one of the slides that I took out from last week was um, the internals of a watch where you had a bunch of parts, and my point was that you want to avoid too many moving parts when it comes to trading. So if you get caught up in the VIX, 
the VXX and, and all this other stuff, you can get in a lot of trouble really fast. So be careful with that. Play with it if you want, but be careful. Uh, yeah, you know, those you, you should short them. Yeah, there's a horrible decay. You, can sh you should short anything that's an inverse um, um, ETF because it's going to have a normal decay. And the VXX is going to have a horrible decay. The only problem with something like the VXX is if you short that and the market blows up, then you're going to be a hurt and pop. You're going to be in a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of trouble. So it's very dangerous. Now, I know some people like, well, I go long the futures and I short the VXX. I'm like, whew, okay, or I short the futures and long the VX. I forget what it, what it is, one of those type of things. But you start ended up with a lot of moving parts. So let's keep it simple. I know I, I kind of threw volatility at you, and volatility is an important concept. But I would avoid trading volatility outright like something in the VIX because I think you can get in a lot of trouble real fast unless that's unless you make that like your your goal in life. Okay. Now let's get back to the simple. Um, I got a few new clients coming in, and one thing that I always forget is that maybe everybody doesn't understand or know the basics. And um, even though it's in layman's, you, you have to see things actually in practice to, to get them. So let me just show you something here. This was a setup we had a while back. I like the fact that it was um, an accelerating momentum type of strategy where the market was kind of working its way higher and then it began to accelerate higher. And you had a knockout move. Now, when I went back and looked at my records, I couldn't couldn't figure for the life of me why in the world I had an entry way up here, and then it dawned on me. The reason was was that it was a TKO on this particular day. So forget about all this data for a second. That's why the entry was way up here. Now, with the entries, it's a trade off. If the entry is too high, like it kind of appears to be here, then by the time the market, if it's once it's down here, of course, by the time it gets all the way to there, it's already kind of overbought and very hard for it to continue higher. You're also missing out on the reversion to the mean move when you have a very high entry. But on this particular day here, that was a place to entry. But any, in, anyway, I left it kind of high um, in here waiting for a trigger, and after a few days I took it off. Now, the point I want to make is a textbook entry, let's say that this TKO didn't trigger, and then this market pulls back. Well, a textbook entry would have put you in right around here because, let's say, on this particular day, you want to go in right above that high, so the next day you would have triggered in. Well, I like to give it a little wiggle room. Now, this is kind of extreme because we were initially going after the TKO. But let's say on if you were looking at this pullback, and you see it's pretty volatile stock in here, so you probably want an entry somewhere around here. And you could go back a couple of bars and say, okay, I want it above this high plus a little wiggle room. And even an entry there, you can see, which is a little bit away from the markets, Market rallied up, or the stock, I should say, rallied up, and then it implode, imploded. So you didn't get a trigger. Uh, one thing, too, remember these triggers, there's only one pattern of mine that's buy on close, and that's that's an IPO type of pattern. And I think it, I, I haven't shown it yet, in, in the, I think it's, uh, or I haven't found any setups to put into service just yet with it. So that's the only setup that I have that's actually, does does it trigger intraday so to speak it triggers at the end of the day the point i'm trying to make is if i have an entry of 22 and it goes to 22 and a half intraday then you would take that you would take that position you wouldn't wait around to the close to enter that position so 99.99 percent of the time let's say if your entry is here and it, it hits it intraday you take that entry you don't wait for it to close above the entry because sometimes it'll hit that entry and keep on going and that's a beautiful thing okay so any questions on entries before I go further again I, I sometimes I, I, I forget okay that uh, not everybody knows the, the basics and the wiggle room thing again can often keep you out of trouble no trigger no trade so for instance, on this day I had it in the service, and then on this day I had it in the service, and you know, for the next three or four or five days, and then when it began to implode a little bit, I said, "Ah, the heck with it, let's take it off." And then that doesn't count as a winner or a loser because it counts as a non-trade. Um, a couple of random thoughts before we get into the next segment of the show. 
Um, I, I still think there's a potential for a blow-off type of move created by performance anxiety. The S&P at new highs, and even the NASDAQ at 14-year highs, I think is, um, is going to wear on people, people who did not get in. In 2009, everybody said, well, that's it. I'll never buy another stock again. Of course, that's that helped to make the bottom, obviously. And then you get a market since 2009 that's just pretty much gone up, and it makes new highs. And those who swore they would never buy another stock are now thinking, geez, I better, I better, I better, I better get into this market or um, be left behind. It's kind of interesting. I do occasional segment on Colorado Radio Network. Uh, winning on Wall Street um, often has me on. I've been on some of the other hosts too, some of the business hosts over there. And what commercial while I'm on on break waiting to come on is like there's this room noise, like cars running by. And it's like, what's that sound? It's like, well, that's the sound of the stock market passing me by. And it's kind of a it's kind of a cool commercial. You know, like when the market's selling off, it doesn't make much sense. But when the market's making new highs, like it is, it's kind of cool and it makes a lot of sense. And that's probably what's going through people's head is that, well, the stock market has passed me by. So you could end up with a blow-off type of move. John, we'll get to individual stocks in a few minutes. Uh, so wait, for we, wait till we get to the charts for that. But, yeah, I'll be happy to talk about that. Um, just remember, it's never different this time. I've, I've taken some – I wouldn't say I've taken some heat. i got a nasty gram or kind of a – I don't know what. Some guys thought I was always bearish. I'm not always bearish. In fact, I try not to label myself, if anything – and the reason you don't want to be always bearish, always bullish, is because you're not going to see the other side of the market. And there's always two sides of the market, the upside and the downside, right? And as long as you're on the right side of the market for the most time, most of the time, you're going to do just fine. What you have to be careful of, though, is it is never different this time. Some people are thinking, you know, people used to be negative. Oh, the Fed's propping the market up. And now it's all of a sudden it's like, well, the Fed's not going to let this market fail. It's like, ugh, geez, you got to be careful with that type of analysis. I, I just literally gritted my teeth. It's a boy, I could get you to a lot of trouble really quick. So be careful that um, it's different this time. It's probably the three biggest dangerous words on Wall Street. Um, and this leads me to the next thing. It's like, I always do the right thing, and I've been preaching about this quite a bit. Um, since 2009, the markets kind of look like this. Okay, it has its stair stepped higher like this, like a nice, beautiful trend following type of market. You've had some pretty serious rollovers throughout. And if you'd have bought it here and you're still holding on here, you look like a friggin' genius, okay? Instead of getting stopped out here and shorting in here and getting stopped out here and shorting it here and stopped out here and shorting it here, like a good little trend follower, okay? So you have to do the right thing. And in doing the right thing, you won't be right every time. But as Greg Morris wrote in uh, his new book, Investing with the Trend, which is a good book, by the way, good read. Lot, it's a, it's a, a doorstop, as they call it. It's pretty big. Uh, it's got a lot in there. And I'm, I've kind of just taken the gems out. I haven't really studied the indicators and all the other uh, plethora of knowledge that's in there. But I've just kind of taken gems out. For me, I mean, that's that's what that's my takeaway from the book. It's just the gems are incredible. And he talked about being right over time is what's important. And I think that's the mentality that we have to have. And, I'm, in fact, when we get in the next segment, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But just uh, work to be right over time and, and not right every time, okay? Now, this is, the, uh, this is the intertwined thing that I've been talking about. I've parsed out an introductory video I did a while back into several pieces for an introduction to trading series. And uh, those are all, you can find those on my website. And if you're not already in my YouTube uh, subscription group, it's free. Uh, make sure you sign up for that so you'll have access to these uh, videos. And even if you're a little bit more seasoned trader, Sometimes it helps to go back to the basics. I think I think that's one advantage I have because I have an educational business is I'm always forced to go back to the basics. And if ever I question a market, I find myself saying, "Okay, Dave, you're 
you, you're supposed to have the answers. What's the just what in its simplest form is this market going up? Is it going down or is it going sideways? Okay, um, where are you going to get in? Eyeball the volatility. Decide on where that stop should be, where that protective stop should be, where that additional profit target should be, and how you're going to trail that stop. Get that plan together and follow that plan. And it, it's amazing how easy it is. It never get. I should say easy, but non-complicated. Okay, it could be or easy it could be. As long as you just keep the basics in mind and you don't try to overcomplicate things too much. And, and in doing those videos, I got to really thinking about how if your money management gets better, you become more successful. But not only that, but your psychology gets better because you understand the control of the money and you're not losing too much. And then you're you're making some here and there to kind of make you feel good from a psychological standpoint. So you're not feeling too bad, not feeling too good, and then all of a sudden you're going to be more likely to follow the methodology. So if just one of these strands improves, the other two automatically improves, and then it becomes sort of a, what's the word we used to use in, uh, in computers? Recursive, I guess. Whereas one becomes better than the other, becomes better than the other, becomes better, and then that process just continue. So I'm going to whip through these really quick because we, we talked about them last week. But let's say that the money management, you decide, okay, on this particular trade, I'm just going to, I'm just going to trail my stop and I'm not going to micromanage myself out. So you ride out a big winner and you got about, you're up about two or three hundred percent and you give back a little bit, but after all is said and done, you, you made about 150, 160% on the trade or whatever. So you are you begin to think, okay, I think I'm beginning to understand this methodology. I'm going to get a little, I'm getting a little bit better at recognizing these winners. So my stock selection has improved. And the fact that I was able to ride out that winner, I'm thinking, well, wow, that's how you do it. You mean I can make 100%, maybe 200% on a trade? And all I have to do is trail a stop and leave it alone? Well, guess what? Psychologically, it becomes easier to follow your plan. Well, guess what? If you follow your plan, you're going to end up riding out another winner. So you can see how this one makes this one stronger, makes this one stronger, makes this one stronger, rinse and repeat. And all of this strengthens or helps to strengthen and improve your success. Now, another example would be that let's say you're going through a drawdown and that can be tough that'd be kind of tough so you allow yourself to be stopped out well if you allow yourself to be stopped out and then now market could be a bad teacher now don't get me wrong but let's assume that you get stopped out and a bigger move begins to develop you haven't seen one in the last five years so you don't know what that is if you've only been trading for five years but let's say let's say you have a been trading for a long time and a bigger move does develop, meaning that the market begins to roll over, you get stopped out and it keeps on rolling over. Well, the next thing you know is that, well, wait a minute, boy, I'm glad I got out of these positions because if I'd have stuck with these positions, I would have lost half of my money in the market as opposed to losing only a small percentage, maybe 5% or 10%, whatever the case may be, which is a lot easier to live with than half. So now your psychology is like, okay, I understand there could be losses in the market. I now realize that he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So you get stopped out. You're out of the market. Your thinking becomes a little clearer because you're looking at the market a little bit more antiseptic kind of manner. And it's like, so you become selective and or you begin to see the other side. So let's say that market is doing this, you get stopped out, and all of a sudden it starts doing this, it's like, well, wait a minute, this might be a shorting opportunity. So now your understanding of the methodology becomes better, and then if you wait because you know you need to wait for conditions to improve because your psychology has improved, the next thing you know you're riding out a new winner, and then you go through that recursive cycle with the other one. So as long as you're able to follow the plan and at least improve on one aspect of trading your other aspects are going to improve quite a bit now the biggest the biggest problem that I see 
and I see it over and over and over again. And I don't do much marketing, but um, lately I've been thinking about doing a little marketing just because it's a revolving door type of thing. Ideally, I'd like to get a few clients and just stick with them, have them stick with me forever. And that's literally what I have in some cases where some guys have been with me forever. But it's the revolving door aspect drives me crazy, and I'm just going to have to get used to it. And that's the way life is. Everybody's out there searching for the next guru. Nobody wants to face reality. My best clients, as I've often, often preached, come to me, stay for a little while. As soon as it gets choppy, they leave. They come back in 10 years. Okay. So I just got to get my head wrapped around. If I'm going to stay in, as part of my business and be in education, then it's going to be a revolving door, and it's just going to happen. What causes that revolving door is market trends. Everybody thinks I'm God. Everybody thinks this is the best, best methodology of the world. What happens, market begins to sell off, and it gets choppy. It doesn't trend down. It just chops around. And then all of a sudden, the equity curve does this, and it just kind of flattens out. Well, right around here, somewhere in here, oh, it no longer works. They go off the change for rainbows, and then they quit. Now, those clients who can, who ride out and up, and then they ride out a couple of downs, and then maybe even a down market turn and, and short and everything, and then they ride out some nice ups, those are the clients that stick with it longer term. By the way, it's not my way or the highway. This could be any freaking methodology, okay? Any methodology that's a viable methodology, make sure you stick with it long enough to reap the fruits of your labor. Now, viable being the key word in that sentence. How do you know it's viable? Well, I can tell you that I can tell you, I can't guarantee, but I can tell you that I think my stuff is viable because I've been using it for 20 years and it's, or 20 something years and it seems to have worked sometimes a lot better than others. But if you can ride out a complete cycle, okay, and I guess it's kind of like an equity cycle where your equity goes down and then goes up again, then you have that aha. In fact, my best clients are where the equity goes down and then it goes up because they're like, wait a minute, I know I can lose money, so I'm not going to get too excited over here while I'm making money. I'm not going to be depressed, don't get me wrong, but I won't get too excited knowing that this thing could turn back down at any time and then we could go through another cycle, rinse and repeat. So if you ride out a complete cycle, which could take six to eight months and sometimes maybe even a year or even a little longer to capture a really good cycle, okay? And then, of course, you begin to understand the ups and downs. You begin to see both sides of the market. And one thing that I often leave out, you begin to see the flat side of the market too. Hey, sometimes there's no action to be taken. I think it was July or whatever. We didn't have one trigger position, or it was June. I forget when. But the market was choppy then, and we never did get a trigger. We, we had a couple of stocks set up. We went after them. They didn't trigger. So a lot of people can't sit around and do nothing, right? And let's face it. We're all motivated individuals in here. I, I'm guessing most of us are motivated. Otherwise, you wouldn't be trying to get more educated about the markets. Your doctors, your lawyers, your automatic transmission mechanics, you don't get, if you don't fix one transmission, you're not going to get paid, right? But sometimes in the market, the best thing to do is just sit and wait. So there's two sides of the market, and the third side is just sitting and waiting. So you begin to understand the ups and downs, meaning that you want to be long doing this, short doing this, and flat doing this. So now the methodology has strengthened your ability to follow that methodology becomes even better. So you begin to remain calm in bad times. I know, haha, -ha, relatively calm, okay? And you don't get too euphoric in good times. And this is something that I've gotten a lot better at is not getting too euphoric in good times. I almost, it's like I, I find myself detached and almost like, oh, that's interesting. Now, if I could learn how to do that on the downside, I would probably be much better. When a stock goes against me, I drop an F-bomb. I dropped an F-bomb this morning already, okay? Even though I had some stocks going up nicely, I, you know, I was like, oh, it's going up. Okay, that's fine. It's doing what it should do. And then it's like, F, you know, this thing's going, going the opposite way that I want. But overall, longer term, you got to be careful not to get too euphoric at a good times and too bummed out in the bad. And this is, like I said, I lose more clients right here Okay, most people quit here. I lose more clients right here um, because they think it becomes a permanent income hypothesis. And it's kind of scary, too. Like, I'll have people like, I'm going to quit by 20 years successful, um, I don't know, I'll just pull something out of the air, real estate business. 
because we just made 20 something percent with you in four or five months. And boy, if I just take that permanent income hypothesis theory, we're going to make it, we're going to be making thousands of percent in here. And it just doesn't always, unfortunately, work that well. I probably spend too much time tempering everybody's expectations. Um, Mountain Dew's kicking in. But longer term, following a plan, you'll do just fine. IPO bubble, like the Monty Python boys say. I'm not dead yet. And it's kind of interesting. Um, it kind of died out right after I did the webinar. And now it's kind of coming back with a vengeance. <laughs> I'll probably note to self, never do another course in the middle of summer. <laughs> I need to relax like my European brethren. <laughs> so anyway. I digress, but like I said, I did the course, uh, things stopped sort of working for a little while, and then they started again. Now, what was kind of interesting is we did have one or two really take off during that time, so it wasn't a complete wash, but percentage-wise, it was fairly, fa I use the word fairly abysmal, meaning that it was uh, one or two out of five or six took off nicely, and the rest didn't, didn't do so well. So going into the webinar, and and uh, especially further back in 2014, late 2013, uh, you could take more of a shotgun approach, meaning that you could you could go out and buy a bunch of IPOs and you probably do pretty darn good. But now it's um, it, it seems like in more recent times it's it's back to the outliers. Like I'm saying, that one or two big winners are going to save me from looking like a friggin' idiot, okay? Because they took off. Uh, what's good, though, is that the shotgun is coming back versus the outlier, meaning that there are more and more beginning to rally, and it's not such an um, aberration with that outlier or two. The good news, too, is the dichotomy is getting better. And the dichotomy is they, uh, there's a fly and a die, meaning that it seems like sometimes IPOs come public and they keep going public. I'm sorry, they keep going higher, okay? And sometimes they come public and they just go straight down. Well, Will Rogers once said, you want to buy stocks that are going up, and you want to, if they don't go up, don't buy them, okay? And this is Mr. Rogers here. Um, which is kind of a, a funny thing, and kind of one of those, it's almost like a yogiism, but it's kind of true when it comes to IPOs, because a lot of times they either take off, or they don't, and you want to buy these, and you want to avoid these. Let's just take a look at a couple things here. And the question of the IPO bubble, look no further than chicken on the stick stock, Loco. We talked about this one a while back, and it went up 100% over a short period of time. Now, I wouldn't trade this one because it didn't set up or anything, but it makes a good example of – what we've seen not too distantly or not too far away in the IPO market. And then that was cam that was chicken on a stick. Now look at camera on a stick, which is a GoPro, okay? And it's taken off in here, as you can see, and done fairly well as an IPO. So not that you want to rush out and trade either one of these stocks, but my point is if chicken on a stick and camera on a stick can rally Maybe a biotech company that has the promise of curing some hard disease or something can take off. Um, as you know, or you may know if you've been coming to the webinars, we are long Zen. We've got a trigger back here. And uh, by the way, we've got a re-trigger here. This was a, a stop nick, and that's a little lesson in discretion. Uh, sometimes a market will come right down to your stop, just kind of kiss it, and then, of course, take off again. So you can use a little discretion and stay with um, – Stay with it if you want, okay, or I suggest you should, okay, if, if you're disciplined, I should say. Um, if you're not disciplined, the problem then becomes, oh, it hit my stop. Let me give it some room. Oh, well, wait a minute. Let me give it some more room. Well, wait a minute. Let me give it some more room. Before you know it, you're down here somewhere, and this thing turns into what I call a fly and a die. It just absolutely dies as one of the IPO patterns. And those, unless you want to be in that fly phase, but you want to avoid the die phase, obviously. But anyway, as you can see, from here or from here, however you want to measure it, up to here, it's been a decent run. It's not the biggest winner I've ever seen in my life. 
but so far so good and it is an IPO okay and we are riding that one out that's one of the um, one of the ones that's doing fairly well so the point I'm trying to make is the IPOs are still alive and well I still think there's opportunity there uh, tomorrow uh, I'm gonna have the second IPO webinar as part of the IPO course uh, if you already signed up for the original IPO course check the countdown timer on my website and or go to the IPO page behind the firewall uh, to gain access to that if you are if you are interested in joining us then you have to uh, sign up for the IPO, IPO course under the store and I'll give you um, access to the um, webinar and a password but we're going to talk about these things again tomorrow and what I do uh, in these follow-up sessions, it's it, there's a theory. There was a theory session that was the original webinar, which you you will download the um, the four parts of the course. And then there's the practice session where we go in and we show, or I show, I should say, what we learned in theory and how we actually apply that in practice with uh, many times actual real trades. And what I'll do. Tomorrow, what I did last time too, and I'm going to spend even more time on it tomorrow, is we're going to focus mostly on the charts, uh, looking at what happened, looking at what worked, what didn't, and more importantly, we're going to focus on the charts to try to find some new opportunities, to try to find that next big winner to cover the price of the webinar and then some. Okay, uh, enough about that. I think everybody knows by now I did open a store on the site, so check that out if you get a chance. Also, um, I'm very proud of these drives. I probably should charge 10 times more. At least that's what I was told. I had a friend from France visit. He thinks I'm too cheap on everything. Um, but I just I just think there's a lot of bang for your buck in these flash drives. And a lot of the questions that come up during these webinars and throughout the week when I'm answering these emails are covered, obviously, in these webinars. It's just a plethora of knowledge. And I'm real proud of them. And I know it's kind of vain to feel that way but uh, hey you know what if I can't be proud of my work um, you know who else can be but check them out we got 2004 volume one we covered a lot of stuff in the first half of this year and again this is just some of the stuff I started putting on this uh, sheet and I actually had to broaden out my canvas because I ran on a room so good stuff um, I don't want to jinx myself <laughs> no one's ever wanted to return one everybody's been happy so far so I've been you know knock on wood been lucky with that Anyway, um, I think everything else, you know everything else that's in here. I'm not going to bore you with that. Just check my store for more on that. The first two books, by the way, are still relevant, and I wrote all the books to complement each other. So the first two books are still relevant. If you need those, they're in ebook format, and they're pretty cheap uh, as far as price is concerned. All right, let's jump out to the charts. We can always come back to the uh, slides. Any questions or anything, by the way, before I do get out of the slides? Anything covered in slides you want me to, to elaborate on before we hop out to the overall market? And then if you guys want to start asking about individual stock questions, with the exception of Ford for Don, Don's not allowed to ask about Ford. You guys can start asking about that now. Um, let's take a look at the overall market. And let's work our way down. Okay. Oh, that's a good, yeah, okay, that's a good question. Okay, I see where you are. All right, he said Dr. T referred it to Ego, okay. And he wanted to know, I mean, I guess it might be right here. I don't know. Uh, John says, in the newsletter, Dr. T referred to Ego. I pulled it up on the chart and was trying to determine when the entry and uh, you took for educational purposes. I think Ego was on my Landry list, and um, I'm seeing a little pullback right here, and it might have been right here, but you can see that it bottomed out in here, and uh, what day was that? Well, I'm not going to have a list that old, um, but I can go back and check. Let's see. Let me do this. That was on 7.15, and, and if you go to the, uh, by the way, and they're not all behind the firewall on purpose. It's just the newer ones are behind the firewall. If you go to uh, my service page,
and you scroll down, you can get all of the um, you can get all the archives on here. This is the the trading service page. So seven fifteen. I'm guessing it was seven fifteen. So if we come down to seven fifteen right here. The newer ones are behind the firewall, but you can go back 10 years in the service and see everything that I did, good, bad, and indifferent. And um, let me just let's see if we could find the Landry list. Nope, wasn't there. Yeah, I don't know where it came from and where it entered. Um, if I had to guess, hmm. If I had to guess, I'd say it was probably right around here because you had this massive thrust from Lowe's and then you had this nice little pullback. So he probably played it and got a little pop out on it to there and then it stopped out. But it was kind of like a better than the poke in the eye trade. I think his point was that even though things were kind of choppy, there were the occasional stock that set up. So maybe I could dig a little further offline and we could figure out when, when that was actually in the list. Okay. 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 Let's uh, let's take it. Let's uh, let me cover the market real quick, and then we'll get into those individual stocks. Keep asking them. Uh, Peas, as you know, actually kind of uh, probing these new highs in here. Only thing I don't like, and I'm just kind of seeing this as we're talking, is that I'm seeing a little bit of a wedge action happen here. Ideally, in markets, what you want to do is you want to see them take off. You want to see a market do this and maybe correct down and then take off again. You really don't want to see a market do this and then just start kind of drifting higher in here. Let me just try to draw it. You really don't want to see this. Okay. I'd rather see this kind of like a flag than this upward drift. Okay. So with today's action, if today holds, then that's got me a little bit concerned about that and I'm just kind of like I said I'm noticing this on the fly uh, again the volatility has compressed so we're due for a move out of that uh, low volatility situation one way or the other okay and you can see I don't want to look at the micro too much but we have tailed off the best levels so we could still be in Flatsville for a while here. As you can see, there's probably a mean in here somewhere. But as you see, the market hasn't done much in quite a while. Let's put in a moving average just for fun. Let's put in like a 10-day like a moving average and see where that gets us. Yeah, it's not that flat. Maybe a 5-day will be – I'll show what I'm trying to show. Yeah, you can see 5-day moving average. You can see – be getting a flatten out pretty bad in here, okay? But as a general statement, market's okay. It's up round, right around all-time highs. In fact, if it closes where it is today, it's at all-time highs. So as a general statement, it's kind of like statement number one, don't fight tape, okay? The only thing, other thing in the piece, as I've been kind of complaining about, is I, I would like, I would have liked to seen them clear these old highs decisively. I kind of want to see that blow off move for a while, have the market take off, not look back for a while, and then look to play some pullbacks along the way. Now, um, the other problem is that I don't like these V-shaped recoveries at high levels. Okay, sometimes they stall out just past the prior highs and then that's it okay but I'm not gonna sit around and worry about that too much as long as the market keeps going to new highs and, and by the way th the thing to do I mean, look at all this think about all this plan about it create some scenarios in your mind know that the volatility is low know that these things could happen know that we could have a fake out move but then continue to follow your plan and if you have a stop that gets hit, and it's more than just a stop nick, like a discretionary call like we talked about, then by all means, allow yourself to be stopped out, okay? Now, NASDAQ, a little bit better story here. I know we had the outside date down yesterday, and a lot of people started running for the hills, and the sky is falling, and it's a uh, um, – last night in my service, I was trying to be funny, and I said a mama eating – a pregnant mama eating a baby, which I, I don't think made any sense whatsoever. 
Not that any of those crazy candle patterns do, but um, the point is, you know, it's a fat sumo wrestler eating a little burrito or whatever. The problem is that you can't get too wrapped up in a one-bar pattern. Look at the one-bar pattern and say, ooh, that's not good. But don't chicken little and call the end of the world on that. Now, it's the application of the patterns and not the patterns in and of itself. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm often, I'm not name dropping, but I'm, I'm just good friends with Greg Morris. He's a good guy. And I met him through the APTA. In fact, he got me into the organization. And he uses candlesticks. In fact, he actually traveled to Japan and studied candles. And he's just not one of the more famous candle guys. So he's a candle person, so to speak. But Greg will tell you flat out, you've got to, it's your application of the candles and not the candles in and of themselves. So when I make fun of the candle people, I'm making fun of those people who get all excited about a one-bar pattern and they call it some kind of bizarre thing like, um, you know, bird crapping on the wire or whatever. Um, it's just one bad day. Sometimes the market has a bad day, okay? You ever have a bad day, hair day? Yeah, I, you know, we all have a bad hair day every now and then, right? It's just one bad day. So let's not get too excited just yet. So far, we kind of recovered from it. In fact, that's going to make another uh, candle pattern. And what's what they call that? Uh, um, I think they might actually call it pregnant when the when the line is within the other one or something. I'm sure there's a name for that. Um, anyway, let's not get too excited just yet. But ideally, of course, I'd like to see new highs sooner rather than later. You kind of squint your eyes and not worry too much about the candles of the bars and so far. You can say, well, wait a minute. We've broken out of this range, okay? It's so far so good. Hermani. Hermani is a pregnant woman. I thought Hermani was the girl from um, Harry Potter. Okay. We'll call it a, a Harry Potter. So right now we have a Hermani here. Uh, let's take a look at the Rusty. Now the Rusty also had an, an, uh, an outside date down yesterday. But today it's kind of clawing its way back in here, okay? And, uh, ah, we have a nerd alert. <laughs> Harami. 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 That's her name, Harami? Or is it the pattern Harami? Whatever. <laughs> uh, it's kind of clawing its way back so far today. It's up about a half percent. That's nothing to sneeze at, right? And my point about the, rust the Rusty is that um, it's, it's um, one step, I'm sorry, two steps forward, one step back. And it's kind of been clawing its way back for quite a while. And if it just keeps pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, then it's no longer a pullback to make it all the way back to new highs. But true, the wrestle action is a little wide and loose longer term, but at least it's improving now, okay? Yeah, Greg Morris wrote at least two candle books. Yeah, he went to Japan and studied uh, the actual candles with the actual people. And and um, he some of the stuff actually didn't work, and I think he might have wrote about that. So I wouldn't get – be careful when you're, when you're doing the little one and two stick candles pattern or whatever. Yeah, Steve Nesson was the other one. <laughs> Mitt Romney. Yeah, Edwards and McGee wrote about key, key reversal days. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, you could have those outside days or key reversal days or whatever you want to call them. Just, just take them within context, okay? And then, and if you get really, really confused, okay? If you get really, really confused, just draw a big, freaking arrow on the chart, okay? Your life's gonna get a lot easier when you do. Trust me, I tried to outsmart the market, especially when I started writing columns. At first, I was like, "Well, I think it's gonna go up tomorrow. No, it'll go down tomorrow." It's like, "Well, wait a minute, Dave. You're chasing your own tail. Stop trying to be so perfect and just call them as you see them." And then that's when. My life got a lot easier. Most sectors are looking pretty good. Even the semiconductors, which were kind of stalling out in here towards their old highs, are now busting out to new highs, especially with today's action added in. Drugs, biotech, all doing well at or near new highs. Health services, in spite of all the things going on in our nation, well, somehow it's going to be good for the health service companies, which it's I can't imagine how, but guess what? It is. So it is what it is, and that's one reason why. I ignore the news. Take a look at telecom. Bam, breaking out the new highs. That was one of those areas. Looked like it was just going to fall, 
from Grace, right? And then it just went straight back up. Now it's up here at new highs. Uh, retail was another one. was kind of rolling over in here, chopping all around. We actually got short a retail stock. And now it's made it all the way back to new highs. And then it's breaking out. And then some, right? So overall, things are looking pretty good. I don't want to beat the dead horse too bad uh, on, on that. I don't want to bore you. For the most part, it's looking pretty good. A couple of areas like chemicals kind of stalling at the prior peaks, but haven't really done anything bad just yet. But take a look at like the transports. They kind of stalled at the prior peak in here. And then now what? Bam, winning, taking off again in here. Steel and iron, big uh, big bull in steel and iron. We got a steel stock on the um, uh, on the portfolio as a potential setup today. Take a look at banks. You know, the S&Ps were kind of stolen out. But look at banks. Bam, accelerating higher. Take a look at uh, financials. You want to be careful not to look at financials in, um, in the Morningstar groups, by the way, because those have a lot of ETFs in there. And that could give you a false reading. But look at financials bases the XLF. Look at that. Broke out to new highs. I feel like uh, Tiny Elvis. Look at it. Look at look at that ETF. Look at that ETF. It's it's huge, you know. So, but break it out nicely in here. So, you know, believe in what you see and not in what you believe. And so far, so good. For me, I'd rather look at 2,000 stocks, 239 sectors, a few ETFs, and make my case, and then look at a couple of indices. As opposed to look at the Nasdaq and go, oh, it's a pregnant Hermani, or Hermami, Hermani, pregnant Hermami, uh, wrestler with a with a little baby or something. I don't know what it is. Nothing beats a hammer doing a down move when you get it at great prices. Well, it's dangerous. So yeah, they, they, that's in Western charts. They call it something else. They call it a tail, or they call it something else. And I hear you, but that's that's pretty dangerous. Um, trading unless it's a complete exhaustion move so he said nothing beats a hammer meaning that it's hammering on a bottom and you've got like a let's say a market's doing this and all of a sudden you got that okay yeah i hear you and then bam it kind of knocked the bottom out the market so oversold it's due to pop right back up i'm not a big reversal fan so i'll see this and say okay it's due to reverse but i take more of a show be approach i wait for one of my setups to occur afterwards but I hear you. Uh, there are, so I guess the point is trying to make, there are some candle patterns, which are also the same patterns in Western charts, FYI, that might signify the end of the trend or whatever. And you could be, you might want to be careful. Yeah, like 2009, market spiked down. Everybody was, not to make, <laughs> not to try to make another uh, figure of speech, but everybody was literally, not literally, but everybody was throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, panicking and then that was the that was the bottom of the deal so the bottom of the market I hear you though but be careful candles like many indicators are effective at, at, at indicating prior trend changes well the only thing you have to be careful with is and this is this is I'm quoting Greg too a lot of people say it's a reversal pattern well what are you reversing okay so make sure if you have a reversal pattern and it's up make sure it's up here and make sure the market isn't going sideways and you got a reversal pattern. Okay, so that what does that mean? What are you reversing? So always know, remember that. Haromi. 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 Is that closer to it? They are candle champs. <laughs> Apology accepted. Damn, that's funny. Okay. Haromi. God, I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm going to piss off a lot of Harry Potters in here. <laughs> oh, jeez. I'm not a Harry Potter nerd. I'm a nerd, but I'm not a Harry Potter nerd. So I'm working on some things that, that are going to be kind of cool that I'm going to incorporate into the business. I think you guys are going to get a big kick out of, um, which is pretty. It's going to be pretty nerdy. nerdy. All right, uh, what else is going on? For the most, okay, the point I'm trying to make is Sector X is doing pretty good here. Russell lagging, but making its way back up. Indices at or near 14 or all year or all time highs, NASDAQ and SP respectively. Let's jump into the charts. My favorite part of the show. James, that's the, James, you're on the service. The stock is on the service. Are you allowed to mention the stock before triggers? No, you're not. I have to slap him on the wrist. ILF. Um, this is 
this is actually in one of my momentum lists. It's, I'm not a big fan of putting ETFs into momentum lists, but every now and then I'll see something and I'll just toss it in the list because I think it's kind of cool. And uh, ILF is one of them. I'm pretty sure it's in there. Oops, if I can find it. Energy 100. Here it is. ILF. No, I may have taken it out and put in something that's even more um, a higher HV. Um, ETFs, as you know, a little lower in HV. Um, if you're going to trade an index ETF, it's going to be choppy for the most part. So make sure you're trading something like an emerging market like Latin America, which I guess is emerging still. Uh, but, yeah, it's a pretty good little trend there. On a pullback, I think that could be worth a shot. The only problem is a lot of times these indices, even these emerging markets, can trade uh, in tandem with our market. So if we begin to crash, then they'll begin to crash too. Harami. How's that? Harami from Frenchie. <laughs> Boy, I better not make any Harry Potter jokes. I didn't realize I had so many Harry Potter people in here. <laughs> true, true. I was, I got shaken out of this one. I think it's going to be still in less. Yeah, it's in my minimalist here, as you can see. Um, but I got to shake it out, kind of like a so long and thanks for all the fish. But it's, it's um, maybe on a pullback. This was another one. I'm glad you brought it up. I wanted to bring it up as a stock. It's like, what do they really do? I mean, it's like they, they, they give you a price on a car. I mean, I don't, it seems like that's been around the Internet forever. Um, I've looked at Edmonds throughout my life or throughout the, the time that Edmonds has existed. And it's, it's, it's kind of nice to look at. I just don't understand the business model, but I guess it's not for me to understand. I bought the stock. I rode the stock. I got knocked out the stock. So, but, yeah, it could set up again. Um, and that's the beauty of IPOs is chicken on a stick, camera on a stick, uh, stupid website, doesn't matter, as long as there's some sort of excitement there, then um, then they can go, okay, and that's, I'm glad you brought that one up, so that's a great example of a, um, of the bubble that we're in, in these IPOs, and it's absolutely wonderful. Expect a call from the Japanese embassy. <laughs> that's why I've never been invited to Japan, I've got a book in Japan, and uh, uh, a couple of my books are in Japanese, I think. I'm looking at two of them right here. And uh, maybe that's not why they invite me over. Oh, you know, like candles. <laughs> oh, that kunas. Oh. All right. Um, I digress. ILF? Yeah, we took the Bitta. Bitta is going to be a momentum stock. And it's going to be on the list, as you can see. Yeah, so far so good. Um I would have liked to have seen a little bit more knockout in this pullback here, but you can see it is rallying out of a pullback, and it has been doing very well. Um, it tends to go up and pull back, rinse and repeat. Um, my only concern is at some point it's going to be priced for perfection. I mean, this thing was way down here, and eventually this thing is going to have the mother of all corrections to it. So I would try to find something that's a little bit more emerging, James, than that. But I hear you. Oh, I'm glad you brought up Apple. I'm getting a lot of questions on Apple. Um, first of all, it's a big, thick stock, but it can trend. So even though I don't like big, thick stocks, they can trend. HV is a little low. It doesn't move around that much, okay? Uh, this is a TKO, but it pulled back to its prior little peak in here. And then that peak isn't much above this prior peak. So the point I'm trying to make is, it's kind of lost some momentum. Now, it does seem to be a cult stock where it does, it, it seems like it could do no wrong as far as its, its followers. So if you are going to trade it, then I would get in right above yesterday's high and then maybe put it a stop right below yesterday's low. I'm not personally going to trade it. I don't like Apple, okay? But I know some people who are looking to trade it. But I don't like the pattern in and of itself, the fact that it, it caved out all the way past its little prior peak. But sometimes Apple can de de defy gravity. How much was true pull back since it has moved up quite a bit for John? Let's go back to that. T R T R U E. Um, well, that's that's a tough deal because you do have a little bit of a pullback here. I guess if it pulled back to 20 or so, it might be viable again as a setup. How dare you not like Apple? Yeah, I know, exactly. It's a cold stock. I mean, I guess I'm going to have the Japanese and the Apple nerds 
But I, shit, I'm going to be in trouble. I'm going to have the Japanese, the Apple nerds, and the uh, Harry Potter nerds on my doorstep tonight. <laughs> Expect a call from the Apple Fanboy Association. That sounds like the. Um, there's an organization. I, I'm not allowed to. I, I should repeat. I'm getting in trouble. Uh, Home Depot. I don't like. Uh, one, it's kind of a kind of a thick stock. It doesn't move around a, month, a lot, except last uh, week or so, obviously. Um, when a stock, I don't like a stock that jumps up and makes all of its move in one or two bars. You've got this big gap here, so you've got two days, and that's 90% of its move higher, and then it's pulled back a little bit. I'm actually getting a few questions on this one. I would avoid it because because of the pattern in and of itself, not because it's a big, fat, thick stock. But, yeah, it's going higher. Okay. <laughs> uh, MBL, MBYL, yeah, that's another one of those crazy IPOs, MBYL, which is evidence of the MBYL. You got it. We got it, uh, something um, messed up here. Uh, somebody's dyslexia is kicking in. MB, MB. I guess I, guess I just pissed off the dyslexics, too. The good thing is they won't find my address. <laughs> Oh, that's not nice. Mobile M mobile I M B L Y M B L Y. Um, yeah, this one's this one's kind of taken off in here on a pullback. Okay, so this becomes when they take off like this at higher price uh, stocks like this, then uh, it they become they I lump them kind of more into the core methodology where we're looking for a pullback. So yeah, absolutely, uh, raging Cajun. Or a pullback that's possible. Yeah, Lejeu, Lejeu was something that I recommend. I didn't recommend it. It was in my Landry list as a possible trade. But we're long a bunch of IPOs already. We're long a bunch. I don't know if it's Chinese. We're long a bunch of China stocks already. But it already triggered. But, yeah, that's beautiful. That's a base breakout, John, followed by a pullback. That's fantastic. Hopefully you saw it two days ago. If not, you need to join the service. That's a little soft selling there. Of course, after I guess after I piss off everybody uh, in this uh, presentation, there won't be anybody left to buy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kirks, K E R X. It's kind of wide and loose and all over the place, so I would leave it alone unless it blasted higher and and didn't look back. But you can see it's got this straight up and then kind of this upward drift to it. Uh, which is kind of like the peas a little bit, but not so much the straight up part. I would leave it alone. I think I think you could probably find something better. Good to hear, John. You went John went long Lejeu two days ago. We'll see. Okay. Just remember, you you found that one, but maybe one day you're out having dinner with your wife instead of looking at charts like me, and you won't find that one. And I'll be here for you. Uh, this one's kind of all over the place too. I don't see any structure here. It's kind of electrocardiogram longer term. Shorter term, I hear you. It took off. Uh, it can be kind of thin. It's kind of a thin stock. So I would be careful. It would straight up. It could probably come straight down, plus it's thin. I would take that off my list. I, I wouldn't bother. Gary HP. Um, this looks like a short. This was in one of my Landry lists a while back. Um, it did have a big day down, but on the downside, I'm I'm, I'm a little bit more lenient on that. Uh, it topped out, made all-time highs. It's too many days of the pullback, but I hear you, Gary. I think this stock's in a lot of trouble. Here's the thing, though. We just looked at energies. Energies are at new high. I don't see any reason to rush out and short the energies just yet. Lejeu is an Israeli company. Oh, well, that's good. Okay. I don't want to aggravate the <laughs> – I don't want to piss off the Israelis. Um, this kind of has a bigger picture gatekeeper look to it, okay? So it looks really toppy to me, okay? I wouldn't rush out and short it. Energy's at new highs. It's not one of my patterns, but it looks toppy. So if you're long, use a stop. I wouldn't rush out and short it, though. MOBL for a long trade for John. Come on. Let me see if I can. I get hidden windows back here. Let me close down all this. Get this out of the way. 
Um, let's see what we got. Yeah, this is another. See, this is another example of an IPO, and this one, this one's kind of a, a strange pattern because it sold off first, and then it took off in here. Maybe on a pullback, I'm a little bit more lenient with IPOs when you have these big wide range bars that make up the majority of trend. But in this particular case, the fact that it's already kind of drifted higher in here, now I think I would put it in a camp. I would have to bust out to do highs and then pull back for me to get interested in that one. Okay. Thanks for being patient, Tom. LNG for Tom. LNG. Well, it's certainly in a trend. And we have a little bit of a knockout. I, I think you need a little bit more knockout move. It's boy, you're on to something now. Looks pretty good. Maybe on a bigger knockout type of move. Okay. Alibaba, later this month, expected to be bigger than FB, Yahoo, and SoftBank. F S F T B Y own a lot of shares. Would following Yahoo and F F B Y up to IPO Baba give you a good insight? Um well, that's fascinating, Gary. And his point is that you've got some some stocks to watch that own part of it. Um, yeah, that might help, but the market is the final arbiter. So you want to let that company come public, and you want to see what it does. Um, Gary, were you in the IPO webinar? So before I say too much, I could just say go watch the the. the uh, oh, you weren't. Okay. Um, well, I, I I talked a lot about the fly and the die. And sometimes you have to die and to die. Sometimes they just come public and they go down. Um, Alibaba probably has the potential to be a die and to die, meaning that there's so much excitement about it, it, it could go higher. So if you're watching SoftBank and Yahoo and those stocks are going up in anticipation, um, that really doesn't do you any good because that's just going to push the price of the IPO higher. And it's going to be the, the higher it is, the harder it will fall. Um, so, and without going into a lot of details, it's just one of the patterns that we spent a lot of time looking at. A lot of times it just come public and die. And as I talked about earlier, the dichotomy between those has been pretty, pretty good as of late, or has improved, I should say, as of late. So yeah, maybe, um, let it, let it come public and see what happens. Now, the exciting thing is this has been, this has been the most hyped IPO that I can remember since Facebook. So it, it, it's drawing some attention back to the IPO market. So maybe it'll keep that IPO bull market going, which, knock on wood, I'm um, – oh, that hurts my head. It, me and my clients are doing pretty good in IPOs lately, so we're going we're gonna, to – hopefully that will keep on keeping on. Loco, it was a great place to eat when, it, when I lived in California. So Gary says – Gary's a big um, fan of chicken on a stick. All jokes aside, did they have chicken on a stick? Maybe somebody could take their GoPro to Loco. They take the camera on the stick to go eat chicken on the stick. Um, I don't see anything to do with the stock right now. It, it kind of shot higher, and then that was kind of it for it. Uh, it was a pretty impressive run, but there was really no pattern that I trade to get on this one. They're going to expand into Texas. You're going to get your butt kicked in Texas. Aren't there good? I've never, I haven't eaten too many of them, but I know there's some good places to eat in Texas, so. No, it was a different style of Mexican with chicken. It's Mexican with chicken. Oh, well, God bless you. If you're going to go to Texas, you, yeah, I'm going to go to Texas and open up a Mexican restaurant. Yeah, that's a, lots of luck with that. <laughs> XEC, that sounds like an energy company. XEC. Uh, yeah, we talked about that. It's kind of stolen short as prior highs in here. Okay. A E Z S for Andre. A E Z S. Andre now spells his name with the American spelling, so I get it right. Thank you, Andre. Appreciate that. Uh, I got a big gap down. It's wide and loose. It's all over the place. Um, eh, I don't know. A lot of bad memories to this stock. So I'd have a hard time getting excited about it. Um, and then you got overhead resistance everywhere you look. I probably would pass on that. Okay. It's going to Israel and operating. That's like going to. That's like going to Israel and operating a moving company. What does that mean? <laughs> I 
I'm, I'm not too up on world news. Israel does it. Israel's not moving. Is that what your point is? Opening. Logo has candles on their tables. Opening. Oh, okay. It's like opening a pork store in Israel. Okay, I see what you're saying. All right, gotcha. Oh, and NYC, all movie companies are Israel. I got you. Israeli. All right, I got you. I don't get out much. Well, I haven't gotten out lately. I do get out. Uh, I like that stock, John. And that's one of the ones that was on our list. Um, it actually triggered back here around uh, 13 bucks a share. So far, so good. On a little bit more of a pullback, yeah. Now, it is real thin. Now, keep in mind that I wear two different hats. Uh, when it comes to trading IPOs, some of them are thin. And as private traders, we could go out and trade them. I'm getting a lot of questions asked from people that are – or, or both in the IPO course and the stock selection course and the trading service, or all three, I should say. And you got to realize that as a private trader, you can go out and trade these thinner IPOs. I just can't show it in my core methodology because it's a little thin. It's kind of like there are people out there, I'm not going to say any names, but I've seen it happen, and a new bunch shows up every now and then. So if you think I'm talking about you, I might be, but there's probably going to be a new bunch that shows up pretty soon. And they'll recommend a thin stock to a 1,000 people, and by the time you get in that stock, they're getting out. And somehow these people are, are able to escape criminal persecution because I think it's, it's downright criminal. So that's the problem. But on a private trader basis, if I teach you how to recognize these stocks, which I think I did a pretty good job of at my IPO webinar, of course, I should say. Let me know if I didn't. Then you can go out and trade them on your own. So, yeah, a little bit of a pullback, but be careful because it's a little thin. Okay? It's been 20 years since I ate it. Uh, El Poco Loco. Isn't that the – we had this conversation before. Isn't that the, uh, the, the restaurant that was a front for the crack operation in uh, Breaking Bad? No, that was um, El Polio Hermanis. Hey, wait, it was El Polio Hermani. <laughs> Nobody's going to get that. Okay. Uh, let's clean up a few of these. Hey, Net. Yeah, that's one that really took off. There's your, there's an IPO that really took off. And this is one that kind of surprised me because usually when they come public this high, they don't take off from there. But you had a nice little first little pullback in that IPO, which I have identified here. It shot up, and then it came all the way back in, and then it took off again. Salt is along for Jonathan. Salt? <laughs> I, I, Jonathan, I'm, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to draw my arrow on that one. Not a big fan of shipping companies, by the way. They tend to just, blech. Okay, Kirk's for Tom. Oops, Kirk's, K-E-R-X. Uh, yeah, we talked about that, but it's just kind of trending higher, uh, drifting higher. HD, we did. Sir, for James. J -A -S -R -F. Um. Yeah, there's one of your more. Um, what am I trying to say? It's a newer issue, I should say, kind of still an IPO. Yeah, a little bit of a pullback. I think it has potential. Uh, what do they do? Um, I mean, can can they – have they mounted a camera on a stick or, it, or are they serving chicken on a stick? Is there some sort of fad? You know, what's the story fad of glory is what I was preaching in the core. So if they have some sort of chicken on a stick or something, then yeah, maybe on a pullback. W or VMS? WMS? WMS? Yeah, this is kind of an interesting one too. I'm glad you brought it up because this is one of the this is the Will Rogers uh, type of stock, and you don't buy it until it goes up. So you would have bought it on this particular day here, okay? And they 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 make draining draining systems, I guess. I don't know why that's that's what's the story there? What's the fad? What's the glory? But hey, it's going up. So as Will Rogers would say, just buy it because it's going up. So that's a Will Rogers trade. Your entry would have been at 16. Now you have to wait for a pullback to get in, but it still might be viable. 
Isn't serve actually decelerating slightly though? SERV. No, no, no. That's not decelerating. Okay. Decelerating. That's a pullback. There's two different. There's two different things. Let me show you. Uh, decelerating. I don't like pulling back. I like. Okay. This is and go back. I don't know if you're in the stock selection webinar. Or, I keep going the webinar. I guess it's a course now. But in a stock selection course, we talked about stocks that are doing this. That's deceleration. If you look at it from here to here on a net net basis, it might look pretty good. On a shorter term time frame, deceleration looks like that, and that's where you get that wedging higher. It's kind of like dying out, and then when that happens, sometimes they could just kind of implode. A pullback looks like this. This is good. This is kind of bad when they start to decelerate again at high levels like this. They kind of start losing. That's a bad example, but kind of start losing steam like this. You got to be careful. Okay. So let's get back to the chart on that serve. It's sort of, it's just kind of pulling back. I wouldn't call that deceleration. I mean, I hear you. It didn't get much past this little peak in here, but that's okay because it's had a pretty good run. And I'm slightly more lenient in IPOs because, in general, once they start, once they start rallying and working, they tend to continue to work. Mags, did we talk about that one, Andre? Let's take a look at that again. What's the drainage symbol again? WMS. WMS. Right there, advanced draining systems. So, yeah, I don't know what the deal. I mean, I'm guessing they make draining systems, but their systems are advanced draining systems. Okay, they have electrolytes. Um, it's the stuff that plants crave. Um, shoot, which stock was I supposed to pull up? I forget. I just deleted somebody's entry. Serve. Yeah, we pulled it up. Gracia. All right, ORPN for Mr. John. ORPN. Uh, it's not coming up. ORPN. Oh, there it is. Yeah, you see, this one kind of came public at high levels, and then it sort of imploded, okay? But now it's beginning to take off again. Um, I think it looks okay, believe it or not. Um but it's super duper duper thin, so I'd be really careful with that. It actually triggered. It actually, it actually believe it or not, has already triggered an entry. Um, but what you might want to do to be safe—not that there's anything safe in this business—but a little safer is let it take out that opening range high. That way, you know that everyone who still owns the stock is happy, and it gets rid of those little bit of bad memories there. Okay, so yeah, let it go to new highs, and then and then wait for a setup. But yeah, it is actually over triggered another setup. App for Andre. There's an app for that. Uh no. Um too much overhead supply back here, Andre. It's also not a setup either. Okay. Howard is long, CPRX. Are you you brave telling me what you're long? I might have to pick it apart. Well, I can't argue with that. Uh, I don't like this. This is a case where you got those three big bars up and that's it, and you didn't have enough pullback. But, hey, I'm not going to argue with success. In fact, that's probably – this will probably, if it continues to follow through, it's got decent volume. It will probably make it to my watch list. Eh, maybe. And I don't like this prior little peak in here either. But, hey, if it's working for you, you know, it's not my way or highway. Uh, when I can't read that, could you type it in caps? I guess it's M I K. M I K. Um, no, I can't get excited about Michaels. I mean, it, I don't know. They they sell, they sell the sticks. They sell popsicle sticks. You know, I don't know. Maybe if you can mount a camera to them or stick a piece of chicken on one, I don't know. Um, but it's making new highs and um. What did I just preach? Well, if it makes new highs, if it it's, if it makes a new high, you have to buy, right? When it comes to an IPO, um, I would leave it alone, and I would take it more as a um, generic type of core methodology setups. In other words, let it get well past this prior peak in here. Ignore this bad tick. And then look to play pullbacks along the way. That's one case where I wouldn't go for the the hype or the glory, the fat. I mean, it's a, they sell popsicle sticks, you know. And so I've bought popsicle sticks there before. 
Uh, BFR? Um, it looks like it could be in trouble. But it's too many days of the pullback. But I hear you. It looks like it's in trouble if you want to short it, sure. But, you know, you're fighting the overall market unless you can, well, you can argue it's a foreign stock. And then you got to, now you got to go look at that foreign index and figure out if it's worth shorting or not. T, B, P, H for Mr. Tom. Um, there's no structure here. It just, it's just, there's no structure. I don't see, you want to buy it? What do you want to do, Tom? You know better than that. INUV. And you see, that's the problem. If you keep coming to these shows, I recognize your name. And then I'm going to start beating you up. Okay. Uh, it's got, it's a little too wide and loose. Um, I hear you, though. I mean, it's, I put it on my momentum, my momentum list a while back. As you can see, it's right there. Um, but yeah, maybe on a pullback, it's kind of wide and loose and crazy. It's got an HV of like 80. It's a thin stock, so let's be careful with that. Uh, look at Miss ACHN would buy on a pullback. ACHN for Mr. Howard. Yeah, I mean, it looks fine. I mean, it's it's got a nice little trend to it. Uh, let's see, I've got it in my list. It's right there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of going straight up. I mean, it might be hard for me to buy unless it has a, a really serious correction because it has gone kind of straight up. But as a moment, is it a momentum? Let, let me interview myself. Is it a momentum stock? Yes, it is. Do I have it in my list? Yes, I do. Why is it in my list? Well, because it may do highs. Hey, Jerry, how you doing? Good to see you. Uh, Jerry, that's just kind of peeping out past his prior little highs in here. That's not bad. Um, it's a little bit thinner. I'm not thinner. I'm sorry. It's a little bit lower in uh, volatility. So I like to see, uh, in general, I like to see a more, um, uh, a little bit more volatility. I don't know if you, I know you play options, so I don't know if you're doing something with options on this one. Uh, but, and also, you only have one day of breakout. I like to see a little bit more breakout like that and then a pullback. But, yeah, you got a pretty good consolidation and a longer-term uptrend. So if it can follow through on a pullback, absolutely, uh, basis my methodology. I know you're doing something different, but, but yeah, it's probably not bad having your radar just curious why a Lejeune is considered a good setup when it only had four days in the green mixed in with one day in the red and four-day pullback higher. I was under the impression that it was ideal for stock and trending roughly 10 days green. Okay. Lejeune is an IPO, so I'm a little bit more lenient there, first of all. Second, let's pull up the stock. Okay. It had a base, and then it had kind of another base back here. It broke out of that base, one, two, three. It took four days to get out of the base, and then it pulled back. So that's the first pullback after a base breakout. So I think that looks okay, even if that was some other uh, generic stock and it did that. I think it would be okay. I mean, I get what you're saying because it's only a couple days out uh, uh, in the trend before it pulled back. I'm trying to think of one of those other ones. That black, let's take a look at like HD. HD had these two big days, but it was already in a trend. It wasn't really in a consolidation. It's kind of like, eh, I guess it was. All right, how am I not talking out of both sides of my mouth? I don't know. I, I don't like HD. How's that? Whereas this one, to me, it looks like it broke out, it pulled back. I guess the answer is I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to the IPOs. I mean, to me, this looks kind of like a good setup. It just looks like it broke out pull back after a base and it's ready to take off higher. Whereas the other one kind of looked like an exhaustion type of move. And you got to realize there's some excitement still in this Lejeune, whereas what is HD? Home Depot? Ooh, hoo, hoo, you know, not so exciting about Home Depot. Uh, Raymond, that's my setup for today. I can't talk about that one, but uh, I want to give you a high five. Okay. I'm a Frenchman from Israel, so I am Lejeune, <laughs> raging Cajun. <laughs> BDR for Andre. BDR, uh, kind of thin, and, and, and just this is a new issue because look at it look like looks like two different stocks here, but it just kind of shot higher. It went up a hundred percent or more. I call that a, um, a bottle rocket. Those are kind of dangerous to trade. EXAS, EXAS. Uh, yeah, I've got that. That's on a pullback. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's looking pretty. I mean, it's a little frothy, but not bad. But, yeah, if it pulls back, it might be worth a shot. MRD for when? We're going to have to wrap things up in just one second here. MRD. 
Uh, we got a bad tick in this one, so it's going to be hard to look at. But, yeah, not bad. I mean, it's it's going higher. Uh, maybe on a little bit of a knockout type of move. Okay. I mean, it had it lost a little bit of momentum in here, but on a knockout move, it might be worthwhile. And we'll do BDRX, and we'll, in, we'll finish up BDRX. Nope. Well, all right, let's finish on Novotel then, MBTL. Uh, a little thinner stock. Yeah, it's a little too wide and loose longer term. You got bad memories here. You got electrocardiogram action. So I think I'll leave that alone. Well, we're at right about the time where we need to wrap things up to make the recording work. So let's go ahead and, uh, and do that. Uh, as I said at the beginning, and as I say each week, I appreciate you taking time to out of your busy schedule to um, to be here. I'm, I'm humbled by your appearance. And like I said, I, I learn a lot from these shows too. So from a selfish standpoint, I really appreciate it. Um, anything unanswered, uh, daviddavelander.com. And again, I appreciate it. Everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again. And then I guess I'll see you guys again next uh, Thursday. Thank you so much.